I'm going to show a video. It takes about seven minutes. My son Michael called me on the phone. He said, why do you show that video every year? I said, because I like it. And uh, I eat the same thing for breakfast every day. I've been married the same woman for 57 years. I was still not tired of it. A little video about Billy Kelly. Some of you have seen it before at the summit. But uh, there's a lot of Billy Kellys out there. This, this video always touches my heart. And it's got God all over it. That's what we need. We need God all over us. So yeah, yeah. just bear with me, okay? Thank you. Amen. The first ball he threw, Dangerous Dan laid it over center field fence, and they beat us four to two. After losing that ball game, I was so upset. I went and bought me a fifth of liquor. I went to Joe McDonald's Pool Hall there on Gay Street in Knoxville. And there's an extra long flight of steps went up. I went up, went back to the restroom, and I don't know how much I would have drunk. Well, I drunk enough of it to knock me out. And I, that was about uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I laid down on that restroom floor, dog drunk, vomited all over the floor, wallered in it, my cloak tore a hole in my trousers. Man, I was an office fix you ever seen in your life. And about 6 o'clock that evening, some old boys was leaving the pool hall. And they went down, and when they got on the street, why, well, there's uh, uh, some fellas handing out tracks. And uh, they, uh, to keep them, get them off of their back, they said, hey, said, why don't you go up there to pool hall? Said, old Red Kelly's laying up there, dog drunk. Give him some of them tracks. Well, they came up, found me in that drunken stupor. They took me outside in the pool hall, and there was, looked like a church pew. Well, it was a church pew, that's what it was, a padded church pew. They set me down that thing. They got some towels, put the cold water fountain, put them on my face, trying to sober me up. Downstairs was a crystal hamburger place. They got tomato juice. Gave me tomato juice, trying their best to sober me up. Then they put me in the car. Stuck my head out the window and hauled me around the block, trying to get fresh air to me. And trying to get me sobered up. And finally they asked me they said, to go to revival with them. And I said, I can't. I gave every excuse I could think of. And then the big one hit me. I said, I got a date tonight, and my girlfriend won't let me go because I knew she was in bad shape as I was. They said, let's go call her. Well, I said, okay, because I knew she wasn't going to let me go. We went back to that pool hall, got on the extension line, and they said, is it okay if Red goes to revival? She said, Lord, have mercy. If he's going to revival, take him on. Well, I tried to get out of that deal. I crawfished every way I could. I couldn't get out of it. Finally, I told him, I said, look, I'm going to go. But I'm going to sit on the back seat. And when the invitation starts, I'm going to get up and go out in the yard and smoke me a, a cigarette. That's what I'm going to do. So I got in. I thought they was going to a little old church house somewhere. They hauled me to the University of Tennessee Auditorium. 5,000 people had already jammed in there for revival service. And uh, when I got out, I sloop like it, I couldn't walk. One guy on one side, one on the other. The usher said, you'd have to take him, point at me, upstairs. <laughs> I reckon that's where they kept the drunk. So up the steps we went. Got up there and he's hot. And if you've ever been a drunk, you know what I'm talking about. I went to sleep. I don't know what they sung about. I don't know what they preached about. But when it come time for the invitation, that 500 voice choir stood up <laughs> and they began to sing, if you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come in your heart. Well, I thought I've had a lot of good times. I've gone to chicken fights and dog fights and I played an old fiddle and honky tonks and, and I've gone here and there to dances and I've drunk liquor and I've had some good times. And they were singing, if you want real joy, and then they got to singing, are there any rivers that seem to be uncrossable? Are there any mountains you cannot tunnel through? <laughs> God specializes in things that seem to be impossible, and he can work a miracle for you. Boy, about that time, an old boy stepped up, and he was um, the vice president of our senior class. I was a president. Had 180 students graduate that year. Old Jim Rufter stepped up, put his arm around me, 
said, Red, where would you go if you used to die tonight? I said, to go to hell, same place you're going. I knew he was a hypocrite. <clears throat> Pardon me, go to church on Sunday and live like a devil the rest of the time. I said, go to hell, same place you're going. He looked at me in tears running down. He said, Red, you might go to hell, but you won't go where I'm a coin. He said, I got saved not before last. Boy, about that time he said to me, he said, Red, he said, stick your foot out and God will meet you uh, halfway. Now listen, I've been preaching 45 uh, years, almost 46. I guess, yeah, it's 46 now. And I've never told anybody to ever stick their foot halfway out and God meet them. I never have. But I stood there and I didn't know this then. I found this out later. Somebody stepped up to the evangelist, Buckner Fanning, and said to him, if you can get that red-headed boy up yonder on the balcony saved, said they don't tell what happened in this meeting. And he had everybody in the house to bow their heads and go to praying for me. And I didn't know that. And I looked around, that old boy said, Red, go on, stick your foot out. God will meet you halfway. And I looked around, everybody had their head bowed. And everybody was uh, praying. I didn't know this praying for me. And he just kept saying, stick your foot out. God meet you halfway. Well, to get him off my back, I thought, well, I'll just stick my foot out, and that'll be it. <clears throat> I was standing right next to the aisle. I stuck my foot out, and when I did, mother and a following it. But out yeah, there I come. I'm going to tell you, listen, last gun I got downstairs walking wasn't fast enough. Next thing I was in a trot, that wasn't fast enough. Next thing I'm in a dead run. Boy, I slid in that altar like a ball player sliding in the home. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> People began to try to talk to him, and I wouldn't talk to him. Wasn't interested in them. My, my trouble was between me and God. And I felt like Jesus was sitting on a throne. Like that uh, thing at Washington of Abraham Lincoln sitting in that big chair. I, I felt like Jesus sitting about 12 or 15 feet above my head in a big old chair like that looking at me. And I slowed down, I couldn't look up. <laughs> My sins are so dirty and black. And I was so lost, I couldn't look up. And boy, I tell you, I prayed about an hour and a half. Some things I confessed a half a dozen times, making sure I got them in. And uh, after a while, I said, here it goes. I'm, I'm going to turn this. I ran back and I looked up toward him. And I said, God, if you can save me, save me. And if you can use me, use me. Boy, about that time. <laughs> oh, Lord. There's a dose of salvation. Came out of a land that's fairer than day. I tell you, I got born again. I mean, saved, redeemed, heaven bound, saved forever and forever. And I didn't I didn't know all about it. I didn't know if I'd known then what I know now, I'd still been running, I guess. Old ugly people look good. Amen to God. I come out of that building that night, and it seemed like the stars came out on dress parade and began to wink at me and say, we're glad you saved. It seemed like the trees just clapping their hands and saying, we're glad you're born again. It seemed like that God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and all that crowd that's in heaven, was leaning over the battlements of glory saying, we're glad. We're glad that you're saved, born again. remember when you got born again? Yeah, you remember when you got saved? Amen. If you can't remember, tonight's the night. Right. Tonight's the night. God never says get saved later or someday. Now's the day of salvation. I wonder how many Billy Kellys we've passed by. That stirs my heart. Stirs my heart for souls to see people saved. Genesis chapter number one. You never hope everybody can find that one. Genesis chapter number one. It was a little tight in here tonight. Things loosened up. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Amen. Well, I show the film every year and just about and preach the same message just about every year. But that's the one God has put on my heart. That's one I believe we need more than anything else. Genesis chapter 1, 1. One good thing about preaching first is 
Nobody can preach your sermon before you get up. <laughs> Sometimes I sit there and I just pray, preachers, don't go there. I don't want it to happen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God. Everything starts with God. Father, I thank you for, Lord, just allowing me to be here tonight. And Lord, all the blessings that we've already enjoyed. Lord, I just pray, God, for your presence to continue. Lord, that you're here with us, meeting with us, speaking to us. And God, we need you more than anything else in the whole world. And we love you and we praise you. I thank you we can come here and worship you. And Lord, if there is anyone in this room, and there probably is somebody here tonight that hadn't been saved, Lord, I pray you'll work in their heart. I pray especially for the pastors, the preachers, their families. And uh, Lord, I pray you give us what we need at this meeting. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Brother uh, Sish preached about this on Sunday, but everything begins with God. It's not about a big bang. It's about a big God. And I want to preach tonight about God. The title of my message is is God. And uh, how big is your God? How big is your God? What is your perception of God? I'm not talking about intellectually, but I'm talking about experientially. How in your mind, in your heart, in your experience, in your life, how big is your God? How great is your God? How awesome is your God? Most people have too low an opinion of God. I don't think really with our finite mind we can really uh, appreciate the immensity of God, the the glory of God, the awesomeness of God. I don't think we're really capable of that, but I think we can do a lot better job than we're doing. And a lot of people, the reason they have a low opinion of God is because they don't know God. How well do you know God? How well do you know him? The Bible talks about Noah. He walked with God. And Enoch walked with God. How well do you know God? How much God do you have? How much God do you want? How close are you to God? How bad do you want God? Remember the story about the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus and he said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he he ran to him. And we could talk about him being a seeker and, and all that kind of stuff. And when the Lord told him what he should do, the Bible said he went away sorrowful. Because he wanted it, but he didn't want it bad enough. And there's a lot of people, you know, we, we wish we had more of God. We wish we were closer to God. We wish knew, we knew God better, but we really don't want it bad enough. It's one thing to wish you had something, but it's another thing to do what you have to do to have it. Over in Deuteronomy chapter number 4, Deuteronomy chapter number 4, I'm going to read verse 29. Israel is in, the Lord's telling them, he said, if you do right, I'm going to bless you, and if you do wrong, you're going to be sorry. And then he tells them, if they do wrong, what they can do to get out of the the mess they're in. Now, in our country, we are in a mess. I think everybody agree with that. And it upsets me, it bothers me. I love my country. I don't like to see all the insanity that's going on. But let me just say this. In our churches, where I believe we're in a mess, maybe a bigger mess, and maybe the cause of the mess. But I just believe, just like our, and I'm not trying to be, you know, doom and gloom, but just, just you, you just look around the country, you just see what's going on, especially here in the Northeast, and you realize what kind of shape we're in, what kind of bad shape we're in. I just want to say this. We only have one hope. Our hope isn't in the president. Our hope isn't in Washington. Our hope is in God. You've heard it said. You've probably said it. It's not in the White House. It's in the church house. 
But it's not just a church house, it's God that we need. Only God can get us out of this mess. Verse 29, he tells the Israelites, If from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou shalt seek him with all thy heart and all thy soul. God says, if you will seek the Lord, and we read 2 Chronicles 7, 14, to turn to God and seek the Lord. He said, if you will seek the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, you'll find him. That seems very simple, doesn't it? But how come we don't have more people seeking the Lord? You know, they're talking about church attendance is down and more atheists than ever and unbelievers are the fastest growing group. Well, what about us? What about God's people? What about us seeking God's face? What about us seeking the Lord with all our heart and all our soul? Amen. Look what it says in verse 35. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know the Lord he is God. I am so thankful. I'm so thankful for my salvation. I'm sitting here with my wife tonight. And Brother Chow, said, you know, tell them one thing you're thankful for. I'm just so thankful God saved us. But you know what? God showed us who he is. Jesus said, who do men say I am? Well, you're John the Baptist or you're one of the one of the." Uh, the prophets. He said, but who do you say I am? Peter said, well, you're the Christ. You're the son of God. And Jesus said, blessed are thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. Amen. You know the Lord because God was seeking you. The sheep don't seek the shepherd. The shepherd seeks the sheep. I'm glad I know the Lord tonight. Unto thee was showed thou mightest know the Lord, he is God. There's none else beside him. Look at verse 39. Know therefore this day and consider it in thy heart. The Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There's none else. There's only one God, the true God, Jehovah God. And he is God and he is the answer. He's what we need. He's our only hope. Genesis chapter 28, if you turn over there with me. In Genesis chapter number 28, we have a story about Jacob. And Jacob's running from Esau. He's double-crossed his brother, and his brother's going to kill him. And he's in a mess. He's in the biggest mess he's ever been in. He's left home. He's left his mother, his father, his family. He's left everything. And Jacob went out from Beersheba. He went toward Haran, verse 10, Genesis 28, 10. And he lighted upon a certain place, and he tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place, and he put them for his pillow, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. So here is Jacob, and he's heard about the God of Abraham, his grandfather, and he's heard about the God of Isaac, his father. And he knows all about God, but up until now, he really doesn't know God. It's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. But now the Lord appears to Jacob and he introduces himself to Jacob who he is. And in verse 15 he said, Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And I will bring thee again into this land. Now many places in the Bible Jacob represents Israel. And God, even in our lifetime, in my lifetime, has brought Israel back in the land. And that's a prophecy fulfilled. 
They're still in unbelief, but they're in the land. He said, verse 16, Jacob wakened out of the sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and he said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set it for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. Now think about that. Here's Jacob. And he says, how dreadful is this place? God is in this place. This is none other but the house of God. And Bethel means house of God. The only reason it's Bethel is because God is there. If it isn't Bethel, if God isn't there, it's just loves. It's God that makes the house of God the house of God. Now let me ask you a question. Is your church, is our church, a house of God or is it just a house? And do we go to Bethel or do we go to Luz? What is the difference between Bethel and Luz? What is the difference between the house of God and just the house? It's God. God is everything. God is everything. General MacArthur said in war, there's no substitute for victory. Listen, in Christianity, there's no substitute for God. You can have all the programs, you can have all the money, you can have all the buildings, you can have all the talent, you can have all the charisma, you can have it all, but if you don't have God, you don't have anything. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Don't take God for granted. We mustn't take God for granted. We go to church, we're pastors, we're Christians. Just don't take God's presence for granted. Remember Samson? The Bible said he wist not that the spirit had departed from him. We can't just believe that just by showing up, God's going to be here. We've had some great summits. We've had some great times here. Some of you folks, we could sit around and talk about the different years. But just because God was here last year doesn't mean God's going to be here this year. And just because God was in your church last Sunday doesn't mean he's going to be here this Sunday. We don't want to take him for granted. When people come to church, when we get up to preach, I tell our folks this all the time. I don't want people to come here to hear me. I want people to come here to hear God. Amen. I appreciate the preachers. I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Gibbs tonight. But I want to hear from God. You hear me with your ears. We need to hear God with our hearts. But we need to hear from God. We need God to talk to us. We need God to speak to us. I don't give my money to the church. I give my money to God. I give it through the church. But it's all about God. We need a revival of God. We need a revival of God. We need revival. Everybody says in our country, we need revival. Pray for revival. We need a revival of God. That's what we need. And that's the only way we're going to have revival is when God brings revival. We have, I'm afraid, too many times in our churches, the emphasis in the wrong place. We have the emphasis in the wrong place. We're concerned about how many people are in church, how many people have come back after COVID, and how, how are the churches doing. I don't know about your church. We haven't come back completely. But my, and that's a concern to me. But my main concern is not how many people are in church. My main concern is God there. Amen. Is God here? Amen. What, what, listen, there's a lot of places where you have a lot of people and you have a crowd of people and God's not anywhere near that place. 
I, I want people, I'd, I'd rather, I, lo I love seeing this church filled up tonight. It's, it's exciting just to be up here and looking out at you. But it doesn't mean anything if God's not here. Right. If we don't have God, if we don't have God, we don't, we're just wasting our time. We're, we're just a social club. We might as well just go hang out somewhere. Over in 1 Samuel, and I don't want to be negative tonight. We're trying to have a meeting that lifts people's spirits. But in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse number 19, talking about Eli, his daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her husband and uh, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed for the pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. This is a sad thing. And again, I'm, we're here to lift you up, not drag you down. But there's so many churches in this country where the glory is gone. There's so many churches where the glory is gone. Amen. It used to be a Bethel, and now it's just a lust. Some of the greatest churches that I remember as a younger preacher and a younger man don't even exist anymore. And you know what it says here, and I'm not sure about interpreting this, but it says the ark of God was taken because of her father-in-law and her husband. You had unspiritual men in spiritual positions. Let me say that again. You had unspiritual men in spiritual positions. And the Philistines came in and they used that ark almost as a good luck charm. And they thought by bringing that ark out, everything was going to be all right. Well, let me just say, and, and it never saved anybody. What they needed to do was get right with God and have God come in and God rescue them. And you know what we need tonight? We need God to rescue us. I, don't, I wonder if we really aren't just sitting here fat and happy and, and really don't know how bad some of the things are that's going on in this world. It's just amazing to me that just the, the stuff that just keeps coming out, coming out, and, and how bad this world's getting. And there's, and there's only one answer. I had the Brother Roloff sing that song. The motto in the homes down there was Christ is the answer. And he's still the answer. And he's still the only answer. Look over in Numbers chapter number 12. In Numbers chapter number 12, Aaron and uh, Moses' uh, sister and, uh, and his brother, Miriam, they, they begin criticizing the preacher and talking about the preacher. And verse 9, Numbers 12, 9, the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And Miriam became leprous. Now we know that the cloud over the tabernacle signified the presence of God. That cloud was a, a protection out in San Diego where Brother Fisher, and I hope you're praying for Brother Fisher, they have a marine cloud in the summer and it protects them from the sun. It protects them from the heat. But there was a flame of fire at night and there was a cloud in the day. And when the folks looked at that cloud and they looked at that flame, they understood that God was with them. But now, listen, because of their behavior, because of their criticism, because of their rebellion, the cloud departed. We can seek God. We can seek the presence of God. But if we're not careful, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And we can quench the Holy Spirit. 
and the glory can depart from us. Just like it was Ichabod, the glory's gone. There's no more glory. I believe this, Brother Gibbs, you've been around a long time. I believe back in the 70s, there were glory days. I got saved back in the early 70s. Brother Fish back here, a lot of different preachers here in the Northeast came out here in the, in the 70s. And it was different then. Didn't, didn't know it, thought it was just as hard as we think it is now. But there was just a whole lot going on, independent Baptist churches. There's a whole lot of soul winning going on, bus going on, a lot of churches growing, starting. And what happened? I'll tell you what I believe happened. I believe it got proud. All of a sudden, numbers was more important than anything else. And I'm not against numbers. I'm for numbers. We try to reach everybody we can. Everyone represents a soul. I just don't see the glory the way I used to see the glory. You got to look for it. You got to really look to find it. A lot of the churches, like I said, they just, they, just become, they just become buildings instead of houses of God. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we all know this verse. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. And we use that as an illustration for soul winning. The Lord wants to come into your heart. And the, the handle on the door is on the inside. And he's knocking at the door of your heart. And he wants to come in. And you need to open the door. And you need to receive Christ as your Savior. And that's a good illustration. But that's not what that verse really means. Jesus, in that verse, the real interpretation, he's standing at the door of the church. And he's on the outside. And the rock music is so loud, they can't even hear him knocking. There's so much commotion going on. And it's so dark in there that they couldn't find a door to open it if they wanted to. Like nightclubs are. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And the sad part is they don't even miss it. They don't even know he's not there. They're just having a good old time. I had a lady come up to me, Brother Charlie was ranting and raving like he always does when he preaches. <laughs> Two Sundays ago, he was preaching against some kind of music, a radio station, uh, K-Love or something. And I got out there in the hallway and one of our ladies come up and said, I love K-Love. It's rock and roll. And I, I said, go see him. I didn't preach the message. <laughs> we don't even miss him. We don't even miss him. That's so sad. You just get so used to going through the routine. and Don't even know he's not there. We need to bring the ark back. We need to bring the ark home. We need to bring God back. He needs to have the preeminence in our churches. It's not about a man. It's about God. It's about God. Look in Exodus chapter number 3. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. He said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place wherein there stand is holy ground. Now here's Moses, and he's in the backside of the desert. Moses was raised up in Egypt, raised, raised up in the palace. He was, he was somebody. He was a, a big shot. 
And God put him out there in the middle of nowhere because God hates pride. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. And Moses is out there in the wilderness, and he's all alone, and he sees this bush. Now, there's all kind of bushes. There's bushes everywhere out there, hundreds of bushes, thousands of bushes. But this bush is different because this bush is on fire and it's not consumed. And the only thing different about that bush that makes it so different is because it's not really about the bush. It's not really about the fire, but that fire represents the presence of God. That what, that's the presence of God makes it different than any other bush. Now, listen, our churches are just like any other churches. We don't have the presence of God. I mean, we got a Catholic church down the street. We've got a Methodist church up in town. We've got a mosque over here. We've got a Hindu temple. What makes us different if we don't have God? We're, we're just like, we're just like, hey, well, we've got sound doctrine, but it's just going to be dead right. doctrine right. if we don't have God. Right. It's going to be dead. We need God's presence. We need the Lord. Moses was alone out there in the wilderness, but he wasn't alone because God was with him. There's something about being alone with God. There's something about being alone with God where you really get to know God and you really get to appreciate God and you really get to love God. Elijah was three and a half years by the brook Kirith. Paul was three and a half years in Arabia and they were alone with God. God time. God time. We have so much busy time. We're so busy. We have such a fast pace of living. But how much time do we really spend with God? How much time do we spend alone with God? How can we really have the presence of God and the power of God if we don't spend time with God? Look with me over in Psalm 91. In Psalm 91, the Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. How much time do you spend in the secret place of the Most High? How much time do you spend with God? How much time do we spend with God? I mean, real t- I'm talking about alone with God. Just you and just you and God. If we want his presence, if we want to know him, we've got to spend time with him. In 2 Chronicles, chapter number 30, and verse 27, the Bible says this, Then the priests, the Levites, arose, and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, now listen to this, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. You know what that is? That's the secret place of the Most High. In that tabernacle in the wilderness, there was the altar of incense, and they burned that incense in front of that veil, And that incense represented the prayers of God's people. And that sweet savor came up to God and came over that veil. And it represents the prayers of God's people. Brother Chow was mentioned about the prayer meetings we've been having here. We need to take time for prayer and being alone with God and getting the presence of God. My office is upstairs, and I don't stand up here as a great prayer person. 
I mean, I, I should be up here confessing my lack of prayer. But Saturday is my day with God. And I try to guard that day. And there's so many times a wedding will come up or a funeral or something will come up. But before Sunday services, before trying to get up and preach and, and have God come, you've got to spend time with God. You've got to get on your knees with God. And you've got to pray. And we need God's presence. We need God to have the the preeminence, not just the presence, but the preeminence. And we're so busy doing everything else, we're, we're, we're leaving out the main ingredient. We're so worried about taking care of everything else, and what we ought to be doing is making sure that we're going to have God there on Sunday, and that we're right with God, that God can use us. The presence of God is what makes your church different. Over in 1 Kings chapter 18, Verse 21, Elijah says, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if the Lord, uh, how long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. The people answered him not a word. They don't, they don't know who the true God is. They don't know who the real God is. In our country today, they're, they're pushing Islam. We have, we have a mosque about a mile from here we have another one about two miles from here and it's like the most favored people and christianity is just trashed and thrown under the bus and people don't know who god is who is the real god who is the true god well they had the big contest up on mount carmel and all the Baalites got up there and had to praise team going and the drummer drumming and carrying on. Hear us, O Baal, hear us. But Baal didn't answer. And then Elijah got out there and he said, hear me, O Lord, hear me. And the fire of God fell. And when the fire of God fell, then all the people said, the Lord, he is the God. He's not a God, he's the God. Where is the fire today? Where is the fire? Where is the fire? People need to see something, we have something that they want and they don't have and they need. People are looking for answers. There are a lot of scared people. I got a lot of lost people who ask me, when is the Lord coming back? Don't you think he's coming back? Because they know this can't go on too much longer. First Kings chapter number two, second Kings chapter number two, we have Elijah. And Elijah is going to be taken up by the Lord. And he says, what do you want me to do for you before I go? He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want what you have. I, I want God on me like you have God on you. I, I'm not hanging on Brother Roloff's coattail, but I would like to have God like he had God. Because I knew he was a man of God. And people today, listen, we, we don't just want to call ourselves men of God. We don't want to just try to impress people with some kind of false spirituality. But we really do, this, this country, this world, has never needed men of God more than they do tonight. That somebody has the answers and somebody knows God. Somebody knows God. I heard a joke. I don't know if you can remember, just a simple joke, but three little boys were playing. And... Uh, one boy said, uh, my dad knows the mayor. The other boy said, well, that ain't nothing. He said, my dad knows a senator. The third boy said, that's nothing. He said, my, my dad knows God. People ought to know, if you know God, people ought to know you know God. I'm not talking about bragging. I'm just talking about it just ought to show up. It just ought to show up. Look in Psalm 42. I love this verse. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? 
My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say to me, where is thy God? This, this is not a lost person looking for salvation. This isn't a lost person looking for truth. This is a saved man crying out to God, has a passion for God, and he's thirsty for God. He's thirsty in his soul. He wants God. He wants more of God. He wants a double portion of God. I would imagine most people in this room tonight are here to get something from God. If you didn't come here to get God, why did you come? I mean, why are you here? I remember we first moved back to Jersey from Texas, and this is not exactly camp meeting country. This isn't exactly the Bible Belt. And uh, I took my family. We went down to Resaca, Georgia, to Sammy Allen's camp meeting down there. And we went down there because we were looking for God. I just, listen, I'd have driven any place. I'd done anything. I just wanted to get in on a meeting where God was going to come. And we need to all pray that God in the next couple days just comes into this place and just meets with us. And just fills up our cup. But let me ask you this question. Are you, are you thirsty for God? He said, my soul thirsteth for God. For the living God. And then the people are saying to him, where is thy God? Where's your God? You remember Moses goes down to Pharaoh and he says, God said, the Lord said, let my people go. You know what he said? Who is the Lord? Well, I'll tell you what, he found out who the Lord was. He found out soon enough. And unfortunately, the people that are the mockers and the scorners today, they're going to find out too. But people, let me just say, people ought to look at us and know that there's something different about us. Not just that we're weird, but because we have God. And if you have God, it's going to show. The power of God is going to show up. There's no doubt about it. Look at Isaiah 44, and I'm just basically turning to these scriptures, not waiting for you to get there. But in verse 3, it says this. I will pour water upon him that's thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. And I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thy offspring. If you are really thirsting, if you're really thirsting for God, if you really want God, God is just going to cover you. God's going to pour water on you. His presence, he's going to be with you and you're going to, he's going to be real to you. He's going to be close to you. I got about a million of these. Look at Psalm 63. Oh God, thou art my God. Again, David, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I've seen thee in the sanctuary. David says, I'm dry. I'm spiritually dry. And I want to see your glory like I've seen you before. The glory of the Lord. Brother Fred Schindler used to pastor in this area. Every year he would have a tent meeting. It was called Camp Glory. And we would go there because we wanted to get in on a glory meeting. We want to see the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I, I thirst for that. I long for that. I want, to see, I want to see God come into the service. I want to see God move. I want to see people saved. I want to see lives changed. Look at me in Psalm 84. In Psalm 84, how amiable, amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. A day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Are we longing for God? Do we long for the, the courts of the Lord? Do we long? If, if we're longing for God and we want God so bad, why are we stopping having Sunday night church? And why are we not having prayer meeting? How come the churches are dark on Sunday, Sunday night, 
and the parking lots are empty and we don't have prayer meetings anyway. I mean, if we really want God, if we really look, you know, if we, if we really are what we, you know, too many people are following trends. We've got this trend, you know. Well, nobody comes on, on Sunday night. I can't get people to come. Just, just go by yourself. When our church, I can remember we had 10 people in, in prayer meeting or 15 people on a, on a Sunday night. Listen, if it's just me and my wife and kids, we're going to have church. Some of the best meetings I've ever had is about 2 o'clock in the morning in this church in the dark with just me and God. We've never not had a Sunday where we had church. If there's so much snow, I've got a four-wheel drive, I'll just come here and I'll just preach to me and just me and God, we'll hang out a while, but we're going to have church. And I, I think it's a sin to shut churches down. I don't think it's the Lord's morning, I think it's the Lord's day. And, and if you don't think prayer meeting's important and you want to change it to something else, listen, you want to have family time, have family time in church. Get your wife, get your kids, and, and get in church. Amen. Yes. Some of you aren't there yet, but you're leaning in that direction. The tree falls in the direction it's leaning, and there's a lot of people in this meeting, you're leaning in the wrong direction. You need to straighten up. Look in uh, Matthew 16. I'm going to close. I'm going to sit down. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood is not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He gives this great compliment to Peter. Right down the page, he tells him that he's going to be crucified and he's going to suffer. And Peter took him, verse 22, and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. The disciples, listen, the disciples, as much as Peter, as Jesus spoke to them, didn't understand the death and the burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were, there were no, no, none of the apostles saw Jesus on Sunday morning. They didn't see him until Sunday night. It was the women. And the, the women, they went to the tomb, but they didn't see the risen Christ. He appeared to Mary Magdalene first. And when they went back and told the, deposit, the apostles, you know what they said? It seemed to them like idle tales. They didn't even believe him. So here he is. He said, that ain't going to happen to you. And look what Jesus says. Get thee behind me, Satan. He went from blessed are thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, to get behind me, Satan. And I think we've all experienced that roller coaster ride in our life. One minute you're up on the mountain, the next minute you're down the valley. But look what he says. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. A lot of people during COVID, they lost their sense of smell. And then they lost their appetite. They had a COVID situation where they didn't have any appetite for food. Some of us are having a loss of appetite for spiritual things. We don't savor the things of God. Not the way we used to. Not the way we used to. There was a time when we were, we were hungry for God. There's a time when we were thirsty for God. There's a time when we wanted God more than anything else. But then all kind of things move in. And we don't have that appetite. We lost our spiritual appetite. Genesis 35. Back to Bethel. God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Stay there. The house of God. And make thee an altar unto God. Worship me. The God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. The prodigal is coming home. Been 20 years since you've been to Bethel, the house of God. Been out there with Laban, out there with the sheep. He's gotten older, he's got a family. But he remembers Bethel. And Jacob said to his household and all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you. Get rid of anything that God can't bless. We're going to Bethel. 
and be clean. Be clean. And change your garments. Get dressed. My wife told me this afternoon, she says, you wear those old ratty clothes. I said, they're not ratty. They're my, I like those clothes. <laughs> but I don't wear them to church. Boy, it's getting quiet in here, preacher. <laughs> Here's what he's saying. Change your garments. You get dressed up to meet God. Don't get up there preaching in your old ratty golf shirt and your jeans with the holes in them and your sneakers. Put your shirt on. I hate ties. Put your tie on. Put your suit on. Show some respect for the house of God. No wonder people don't know whether you got God or not. Where's your God? We ain't getting very far on this one. We're getting a little, little, what do you call it, hard ground, plowing. I think it's a disgrace the way people show up for church. I wouldn't say that on Sunday morning with a lot of lost people that don't know better. God's people want to know better. Preachers ought to know better. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the tree falls in directions leaning. And some of you ain't there yet, but you're looking over there. You know what? Try this. Instead of trying, you know, uh, pleasing everybody and asking everybody what they want to hear, why don't you try to please God? You're not going to stand at judgment seat of Christ and answer to people. You're going to answer to God. You say, well, you're old-fashioned, you're old, you're old folk. I know all that. But God, listen, he's older than I am. And he hasn't changed. He's older than Brother Sisk. <laughs> and they journeyed, verse 5, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were around about them. They were afraid of them. They were afraid of them. Our goal should not be in church to make people feel comfortable. The seeker-friendly church. I'm not trying to make people uncomfortable, but they ought to come in and feel convicted. You say, what, what was it that put the terror of God on was the presence of God. First time I ever went to the church in Corpus Christi, Texas, Brother Roloff's church, I came in the side door, the choir just started singing, and I started having heart palpitations. Let me tell you, I was, I was shaken because of the power of God. People should not just walk in church and walk out like they're going to a movie or something. There ought to be something there, that, that presence of God, that power of God. If you Listen, if you have the presence of God, you'll have the power of God. I'm not against praying, Lord, give me power, Lord, give me power, Lord, give me power. I want your power. But I don't want my son every day to say to me, Lord, give it, Dad, give me your money, Dad, give me your money, Dad, give me your money. I want to say, what about me? Don't you want me? Don't you want me? I'm not not saying it's wrong to pray for the power of God. We pray for the power of God. But we we ought to want God more than the power. And if we have God, we'll have the power. And if we don't have God, we won't have the power. Verse number 7. And he built there an altar. He's back to Bethel. The prodigals come home. And he called the place El Bethel because there God appeared unto him when he fled fled from the face of his brother. You know what he said? This isn't just, I'm not just coming back to a place. I'm coming back to a person. It's not about Bethel, the house of God. It's about El Bethel, the God of the house of God. That's what I'm coming back to. One more verse and I'm done. Ephesians 3. We 
you come up with all kind of solutions, all kinds of methods, all kinds of programs, all kinds of plans, everything we can do to get our church to be built up, to get bigger, to reach more people. And I'm for all that. I'm for every bit of that. But we overlook the main thing. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. The psalmist said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. You have all the ideas you want to have, you knock yourself out. When it really comes down to it, you need to get God. And if you have God, listen, Jesus always drew a crowd. Wherever he was, he drew a crowd. They press, when they heard he was, when it was noise, he was in the house, they, they, they pressed upon him to get to the house. They, they came to hear the word of God. The word of God still works, and the power of God still works. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause, verse 14, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, we could preach that all night. Just to bow down. You know, it's a good thing to kneel and pray. You don't have to kneel when you pray, but it's a good thing to kneel and pray. Brother Roloff would always read his Bible through once a year on his knees. Just shows humility. Shows worship. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the, the spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. And then it says this, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. I want you to think about that verse, maybe take it home with you, meditate on it, to be filled with all the fullness of God. I want all of God I can get. I want all of God I can get. My wife and I have been married, we'll be 57 years this August if we make it. She'll throw me out. My desire is to be closer to her, to be closer than we've ever been. I've been saved 47 years. And my desire is to be closer to God than I've ever been. Our children were little. We went up the Delaware Water Gap. We were on a vacation. We were riding around up there. We came to one of these overlooks where you could look over the, the Delaware Water Gap and the mountains, and it was just real beautiful. There was a parking lot there. We went in that parking lot, and we parked, and we went out, and we, we looked. And the kids were just little then. Brother Charlie was about 14 years old, 15 years old. And we went home. The next year, we, we drove up there again, and uh, the mountain went up behind us, and there was a trail there. So we went up the trail, and there were some higher overlooks, and you could just see so much more, and it was so much more beautiful. And you look down there, and you could see the cars and the people in the parking lot. But you could, it was just, up on that mountain, it was just so much more to see. We went up the next year, went up, I took our little Christian school up there. We had about, I don't know, what did we have, five kids, ten kids in the school. And we didn't stay in the parking lot. And we didn't go up to the first outlook, but we went all the way up to the top of the mountain. And you could see, you could just see for miles. It was just the most beautiful sight. I hope to go back up there this year. I'd like to make another trip up there and just go up there. But here's the point of my illustration. Those people down in the parking lot, they were happy at that overlook, and it, it, was, it was beautiful. But they'd never been up on the top of the mountain. Because once you were up on the top of that mountain, you'd never be happy 
again in that parking lot. And let me just say, the closer you get to God, the closer and the nearer you get to God, if you get away from that, you'll never be happy. You'll never be happy. You'll never be satisfied with the crumbs from the table when you sat at the master's table. 